uh, Neil and the team. I think Neil's going to share his own slides. There we go. Um, am I on mute or off mute? No, no, you're off mute. Okay. Um, Claire, do we need to stop sharing the other? Perfect. Can you see my slides? Not, Not yet. Yet. Oh, sorry, Claire. And Susanna's here. So I'm just going to, I've only had a couple of days to prepare this, so it's a pretty rough and ready talk, but I thought it would be good just to give an update of what we've been doing at Werribee Mercy and then just present a paper on Citravimab, which was in the New England Journal, uh, uh, just released a couple of days ago. So um, I'll just go through that. And then I think at the end, there's questions. One of the main resources that we use for COVID clinical management uh, is the uh, COVID-19 evidence base, um, which is an excellent uh, resource. It's multi-society, it's Australian. Um, it gives up-to-date evidence-based guidelines that are, that are used throughout the country for the management of COVID-19. And the way I look at it is it starts with disease severity classification and then you follow the management pathway. You can also look up specific treatments such as citrovimab, dexamethasone and remdesivir and just see where these treatments fit in the current uh, management. It's also got an ex excellent section on oxygen management, ICU management, general practice management, and covers all age groups, paediatric, adult, and uh, obstetric. And the evidence is graded in terms of quality of evidence and also strength of recommendation. So it's a very good resource. It's um, uh, easy to navigate through. Um, and I recommend that uh, medical practitioners look at that resource. So just a little bit about the Werribee Mercy Hospital Citrovimab Infusion Service. Uh, maybe Susanna can let us know when we first started, but we've been going for several months now. Um, it's an outpatient service uh, that we've set up in our education centre. Um, patients come in either via their own transport or we organise am ambulance transport. It was the first Citrovimab infusion service in the north and west of Melbourne. Um, so we were the first, but we also have services now at uh, Royal Melbourne I think Northern and Western. Um, as of today, we've treated 90 plus patients and one pregnant patient. Um, there's been seven patient hospital presentations post infusion, but we haven't done the full data analysis yet. We've had some patients turn up hypoxic uh, for their infusion. We've called a met call and of course they're hypoxic from their COVID um, and uh, not, not from the, uh, not having a reaction to the infusion. But I think seven admissions post infusion is pretty good. And we've looked at the data, I'm sure we're reducing hospitalizations for these severe, um, these severe um, patients with severe comorbid risk factors. Uh, the infusion's over an hour, followed by a period of observation, and the patients go home. Um, we've had no definite allergic reactions, but as I mentioned, we've had a couple of patients arrive hypoxic or have become hypoxic after the infusion due to their COVID pneumonia, uh, and they've required admission. In the literature, the anaphylaxis rate is reported as one in 500, uh, but we've not seen any so far. Um, Werribee Mercy Hospital is now streaming hospital um, for COVID. So the inclusion and exclusion criteria for citrovimab are very succinctly described in the consent form, which um, uh, you should have copies of, but just to summarise, uh, it's for unvaccinated or partially vaccinated patients, partially vaccinated being one shot only. Um, confirmed COVID-19 COVID infection by PCR. Day five or under of symptoms, noting the first day of symptoms is described as day zero. No oxygen requirement. Plus one of a comorbidity, diabetes on medication, obesity with a BMI over 30, chronic kidney disease, congestive cardiac failure, moderate to severe asthma uh, on inhaled steroids or oral, oral, oral corticosteroids over the last 12 months, age over 55 and uh, significant COPD. Where people get a little bit confused is um, when it comes to immunosuppressed patients. So immunosuppressed patients are eligible for citrovimab regardless of vaccination status, because obviously they haven't mounted an appropriate antibody response. So that could be a primary or acquired immunodeficiency uh, such as HIV, 
hematological malignancies, post-solid organ or hematological transplant on immunosuppressive treatment, other significant immunosuppressive conditions, or on immunosuppressive therapy such as chemotherapy, radiotherapy, oral corticosteroids such as prednisolone, 20 milligrams daily for 14 days of more, or on a, um, a biological or DMARD therapy for uh, connective tissue or rheumatological conditions such as methotrexate and others. The five day, uh, the other guidelines are the same five days, positive uh, um, PCR, but um, if they're immunosuppressed, we, we give them citrovimab if they're, even if they're doubly vaxxed. I just want to quickly present a paper that was in the New England Journal uh, just published uh, four days ago. Um, but the data was collected in January. It's a uh, multi-centre randomised controlled trial um, over uh, 600 patients, uh, the Comet Eye Study. And this is the interim analysis. So I just wanted to go through this because this is pretty much what we've based our inclusion and exclusion criteria on it is this paper. So the, the same inclusion and exclusion criteria as we use. So just to remind us, citrovimab is a humanized monoclonal antibody. It's actually derived from a patient who had SARS-CoV-1 several years ago. And it targets an epitope common to other coronaviruses and neutralizes them. It's not the ACE2 receptor. And when the paper was studied, they found that it had in vitro activity against other variants of interest, including Delta. And with our real world experience now, clearly it works against uh, Delta. But this is just an interim analysis. This is a uh, cartoon of the, uh, the COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And um, you can see that the ACE2 receptor area is where there's a lot of uh, the change in the genetic uh, makeup of these viruses um, and the different variants of concern. So um, antibodies directed against the ACE2 receptor can lose efficacy once the uh, virus changes into a new variant of concern. The interesting thing about citrovimab is it binds to this orange area here, which is relatively well conserved throughout different um, variants of, the, of coronaviruses. Um, not just SARS-CoV-2, but also SARS-CoV-1 and other coronaviruses. And even through the different variants of concern, this epitope remains fairly constant, and that's where the, uh, uh, the antibody is binding. Here's another cartoon to represent that. So we believe, that, well, it's obviously protective against SARS-CoV-2, uh, variants of concern and, and other coronaviruses uh, such as SARS-CoV-1. So just, I'll just read this out uh, where you can read it yourself. This is just straight from the, uh, from the paper in the New England Journal. It's a phase three multinational randomized double blind placebo controlled trial. So a trial of high quality that examined the efficacy and safety of citrovimab in high risk outpatients with mild to moderate COVID-19. So there were 868 ambulatory patients with COVID-19 and symptom onset within the previous five days were randomly assigned to receive the, uh, the treatment or placebo. Patients were at high risk for disease progression because they're either greater than 55 years of age or they had comorbidities such as diabetes, obesity, chronic kidney disease. And the primary outcome was hospitalization for more than 24 hours for any cause or death through to day 29. And you can see there that those inclusion criteria are very much what we've based our inclusion criteria on. The results um, in the interim analysis involving 583 patients who underwent, underwent randomization, as I said, back in January of this year, those assigned to citrovimab were significantly less likely to have the primary outcome event than those assigned to placebo. And this was due to reduced hospitalization. There were no safety signals identified between the two groups. So just, just quoting the paper, uh, the relative risk reduction in hospitalisation for more than 24 hours or death between patients who received citrovimab and those who received placebo was 85%, which is pretty impressive. Amongst the patients who were hospitalised who'd received citrovimab, uh, none of these were admitted to the intensive care unit. And as I mentioned earlier, with our 90 patients at Werribee Mercy, 
We've had uh, seven hospital presentations. We're not sure we need to look at it further. That could be things unrelated to COVID-19. Uh, but I think seven out of 90 um, hospital presentations in patients with severe COVID-19 and uh, comorbidities is pretty impressive. So I think we are doing some good. This is just some tables out of the original study. Uh, you can see here hospitalisation through any cause up to day 29, three in the Sotovumab group, 21 in the placebo group, and uh, one death in the placebo group and none in the citrovumab group. Adverse events uh, uh, were similar between the two groups. Serious adverse events were more common in placebo and any infusion related reaction was the same between the two groups. So the conclusion from that paper was amongst high risk outpatients with mild to moderate COVID-19, a single infusion of monoclonal antibody citrovumab lowered the risk of disease progression uh, with an out, without an increase in adverse events. Sorry about that. Um, just turn my phone off. I do. Um, can you hear? I've just had a phone ring. Um, am I still on? Yep, we can, we can hear you now. Yep. Yeah. So look, uh, just just some other other developments. I don't know how much time I've got. Let me check my phone. Um, just a couple of other things on the horizon. Um, we uh, there is a there is another monoclonal antibody uh, on the horizon called uh, uh, Ron Romapril, which um, is is uh, can be given up to seven days uh, rather than just the five day limit. So I haven't talked about that, but that's uh, not far off being deployed through um, through the infusion services. Um, so so that is also on the horizon, and, and keep an eye out for that one. Um, I haven't seen the paper on that, but uh, we're looking at starting that soon. Um, Susanna, do you have anything on uh, Ron, Ron and Uh No, I'm just waiting for some information to come through around that. Um, but just going back with us at map patients, just uh, just want to emphasize that we have started doing follow-up phone calls on those, those patients that we have infused, and we're doing those phone calls seven days post-infusion and also 30 days post-infusion. Uh, most patients seem to be uh, feeding back, they are feeling much better after 48 hours post infusion. So, quite a significant change in how they were initially feeling. Mm. Uh, so, that's really promising to see and really positive to see that those patients are hopefully being kept out of hospital. Yeah, so for the GPs listening, um, if you think you have a patient uh, suitable for the Trivimab, um, then try and get them into one of the infusion services. Time is of the essence. Uh, as they say in sailing parlance, the tide waits for no one. And the five days is a sort of a hard cut off. Um, so try and get them referred early. Um, at Werribee Mercy Hospital, you're welcome to contact either myself or Dr. Choi um, if you wish to discuss further, uh, or Susanna. Um, so look, I might leave it there. I've got, Chi, did you want to add anything to that, to those comments? Um, no, I'm nothing to add. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Take some questions. Neil, it might just be um, good to talk about uh, vaccination post citrovimab as well for the. Yeah. So the um, the guideline is that um, uh, it's they need to wait ninety days after the citrovimab infusion before they can be vaccinated, and there is a an exemption letter that we've been providing to patients um, so that so that they can you know not be penalised for for having had the. Uh, um, the infusion and that waiting period. Did you like to speak to that, Susanna? Yeah, the exemption form, um, Don't you don't have to worry about doing that. We can do that from the infusion clinic. We can do that as a patient comes in. So that usually gets filled out by one of our doctors um, and then is sent through to the Australian Reg um, Immunisation Register and then it gets forwarded to a Medicare. So patients will have that exemption through their Medicare. Uh, it is currently okay. taking about two to three weeks to have that exemption come up on their Medicare but we do organise that ourselves so you don't have to organize, you know, worry about that as a, a person referring the patients to us. We can sort Thanks, it out. Susanna. Yes. There, there was a question there in the chat about pregnant patients uh, being given citrovimab. It is a treatment that's uh, recommended for uh, at-risk pregnant patients with COVID-19 in the second and third trimester. trimester. We've treated one pregnant lady. Um, obviously, pregnancy is a risk factor for COVID complications. 
Um, we tend to involve the obstet obstetrician looking after the patient uh, as well as get some ID input, but certainly uh, it's something to be considered uh, for pregnant patients um, with comorbidities, similar to the comorbidities in general patients in the second and third trimester, but we certainly want to make that decision in, in conjunction with uh, their obstetrician. Thank you, um, Neil. If there is any other question.